So I want to do a video on once you get the contract on and you're the buyer's agent, uh, verbally negotiated, what's next? So after an executed contract and you're the buyer's representation, you're the buy, you're you're the buyer's agent. Uh, what's next? So obviously what's next is, well, not obviously, but the, 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 you need an executed contract. So you're going to clean up the contract. You're going to go through all the terms that y'all emailed back and forth between you and the listing agent while y'all been negotiating since the original contract was submitted. And you're going to go ahead and put all those terms that you agreed to verbally or your buyer agreed to verbally into the contract. And then after your mentor reviews that contract, you're going to submit it to your buyer for signature, and then you're going to send it to the listing agent, and that listing agent is going to uh, have their seller sign it. Once that's done, uh, both parties have signed. It's called an executed contract. That's the start of all the time is of the essence. That's the executed date. Um, it's the date the contract starts, okay? Uh, acceptance date is what it's also called. So I, this is a buyer of mine and they made an, an offer on this property and it didn't get accepted. It went nowhere. Um, another buyer got it, outbid me, whatnot. So I made a file for that. And then um, we found another house and we made an offer and this is the one I actually closed on. So that's why you wanna save all your files, even the ones that didn't get accepted or closed, because you never know. You technically need to keep those files. Um, so I have it on my external hard drive. It's just saved under this particular buyer. So in this, this particular instance, I have their file. Now here's everything in here, title policy, everything, even things that are on the DA checklist, because I wanna save everything. Uh, title commitment, um, this was even, um, a title company emailed me this directions, how to get to the title company. I sent that to my buyer, but I kept it because why not? And it's another thing that I'm like, what title company did I use again? And of course it's on the contract, but it's easier for me just to keep this in there. And that way, everything I have. And if the buyer asks for it, like, Hey, what title company did we use? And where was it at? I can just simply pull it up 10 years from now if it's on my external drive and say, we used this one and this was where it was at. So anyway, so I saved all the pertinent information into, or what's on the DA checklist into this file within the file called the end away, that's the address broker. So that's everything that I submitted for my DA approval, okay? We'll go over that in a minute. So first things first, Ryan, I just got it accepted. The, 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 the listing agent just sent me the executed contract. Great. You want to save that executed contract to your file. Okay. Executed contract right there. You want to send that executed contract to your buyer's lender, which is basically your lender. You should have their contact information already. If not, it's on the pre-approval letter. Email it to the lender, email it to the buyer, and an email together. You can put the lender and the buyer on the same email. You're all gonna need to be in the same loop of conversation anyway. Might as well get it started, okay? First things first, I email out the contract. Then I send an email to the title company, whichever title rep it is, it's on the contract. And this particular file, another file I'm working right now, the title rep is with First American Title, but the escrow officer is Lou Nesley. So that's just an example. You need then, so your second email is to send the contract to the title rep. The listing agent might have already be doing this, and I'm sure they are, but there's no harm in you sending it to them as well. And then ask the title lady, say, whenever you receive the earnest money from my buyer, 
please send me an earnest money receipt and say, I look forward to working with you. Send. The lender, you're going you're gonna to say, attached is a copy of the executed contract. Please keep me in the loop of the loan. Updates on the loan progress. I look forward to working with you. And you want to CC your buyer so they have a copy of that contract as well. Now, if your buyer asks, what do I do with this contract? Save it. Save it to your computer. But you're the facilitator in this transaction. The buyer isn't going to do anything, really. You're the facilitator. You're the doer. Your job begins. So what I do after that is I pick up the phone to my buyer and I say, congratulations. Your contract is executed. They knew it was verbally accepted, but now it's executed. And now it's in stone and it's under contract. And if we abide by the rules of the contract and we close on time, it's your house. So no other buyer can make an offer and get it taken from them is what I'm trying to iterate. If you abide by the terms of the contract. Now, but now the work begins for me. So the first things first, we need to talk about a home inspector. And I tell my buyer that I'm going to email them, and you do as soon as you hang up, a list of home inspectors. You can get a home a list of home inspectors on um, our our tur our Texas United Facebook page. Uh, they some people have made comments about home inspectors. You can go and check that out on that Facebook page, or you can Google Trek, who actually holds our license as well. And instead of searching for a agent, you're going to search for an inspector and a particular zip code. You don't have to do a particular zip code. There is a lot of inspectors out there. A lot. Or you can go to the TUR Facebook page. And I've got it in here somewhere. Where is it? To our Facebook page. It's in these emails that I send y'all. And you can actually, I got to log in, but you can actually go and scroll down and find the uh, comments about uh, real estate agents. If you need a, a list, I can send you one as well. But that's a good start for you to begin. Now, if they have one and they say, well, Ryan, they have already got one in mind. Of course, um, if he's licensed with Trek, um, then you, of course, they can use him or they can actually technically use any inspector they want. It's their, it's their home inspection. Um, so don't uh, not allow them to have any home inspection they want done. So example, they might want an HVAC guy, an AC guy to do the home, to, to do the HVAC home inspection portion. Absolutely. Absolutely. You need to schedule that as well. Um, the Trek home inspector is a broad home inspector. And then you can get an inspection for each category, like an electrical engineer to do the electrical, an HVAC guy to do the AC, um, a foundation uh, engineer to do the uh, foundation. Make sure it's an engineer an actual engineer and not a representative of a foundation company. There's two major differences in the two. The foundation rep is trying to sell a foundation peer job. They're not necessarily an engineer. An engineer has an engineering degree and he is certified to do a, an inspection and he's not trying to sell a home inspection, a home peer job. So an engineer. Most of the time, the customer wants a broad home inspection done by a Trek licensed inspector. So once you get that sorted out, whichever one they want to use, you need to call the home inspector and say, what is your availability? I have a home that's under contract. And two, what is your price? And they're going to ask you for the, uh, the square footage, the age of the house, everything you can find on MLS. So have that pulled up. You're going to call your buyer and say they have Tuesday or Thursday available at 10 o'clock. 
which do you prefer? And you need to make sure that they are there as well as you need to be there. Two reasons for that. I go there because if I'm not there, how am I supposed to know what the inspector is saying? So how can I negotiate repairs or, um, or a price um, reduction or a closing cost money in lieu of repairs if I don't know what the inspector said? And over the phone is a lot different than being there in person. And two, your buyer expects you to be there. You're their representative. Um, it's just professional to be there. At all costs, I make my home inspection and I make the closing at all costs. I don't care if I'm sick, I'm gonna be there, I promise you. Um, then they need to be there because it's their house. They are paying for the home inspection. And the home inspection inspector is going to usually have them pay for that fee as soon as he gets done inspecting the home. So that day, uh, usually in a check, a uh, cash, or sometimes they take credit card. A home inspector from Trek usually costs between four and six hundred dollars. It depends on the square footage. It depends on a lot of things. That's why you want to get a quote from the inspector up front when you when you when you ask their availability. You want to ask their price. And then you also want to go ahead and see if the buyer wants to schedule a termite inspection or a WDI inspection. That is actually required on a VA loan. So, um, and most of the time your buyer is going to want a termite inspection. Sometimes the truck inspector is licensed to do a D WDI, wood destroying insect report, termite report. And sometimes the home inspector will have a... Um, Usually they'll have a pest control company that they'll refer you to for that. Um, so a pest control company can do that as long as they're licensed. Now, after I set up the home inspection, let's back it up. Before, right before that, we talked about earnest money. You're going to want to get your buyer, when you call your buyer, you want to also talk to them about the earnest money. Go ahead and get them to deliver it to the title company, ASAP. You have three calendar days to do so. Now, they also need to deliver the option money fee. Both the earnest money and the option money checks are made out to the title company. So the title company, for example, is First American Title and the, the escrow officer is Lou Nesley. You need to make the option and the earnest money checks out to First American Title. You can make it out in one big check or two checks. It's up to your buyer. So if the earnest money is $2,000, and the option money is $250, then $2,250 needs to be written out in a check or cashier's check to the title company, First American Title, either in one check or two checks. One check for $2,000, the next check for $250, or one check for the whole amount, as long as it's made out to the title company. Say, Mr. Buyer, when can you deliver that earnest money check? Um, tomorrow in the morning. Great. Uh, do you need me to uh, pick it up from you and drop it off at the title company for you? Um, actually, that might work. Can you meet me at my office and come get the checks? Yes, sir. Give me your office address and I'll be there. Or two, the buyer can just simply drop it off if that's what they prefer. Just drop it off a First American title and put the envelope, the envelope that it's in, attention to the escrow officer. In my case, Lou Nesley. Okay. Example. Now. They say, well, Ryan, uh, you know, really don't have time. I can't even meet you. Is there another option? Call the title company. Usually there's an, uh, an app called Zocam that you can actually use to deposit an earnest money check. Um, and that is done electronically. Zocam. I don't know if you can see that. So... It's, the, it's got a Z on it. See, Z, Zocam. And the title company can give you instructions for that if the title company uses that, okay? Zocam is Z-O-C-C-A-M, Zocam. Now, on with, on, moving forward, your, your executed contract is sent out, your earnest money, and option money checks are being delivered to the title company. And 
Lastly, your inspections are scheduled. Okay, so that's a good portion of it underway. Remember, whatever your option period is, is that many days in calendar days, no exceptions. So if it's a five day option period and it starts on Wednesday, then you got Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday at 5 p.m. So the executed contract is day zero. The next day is day one, then two, three, four, five, and it ends at midnight. Sorry, not midnight. I apologize. It used to be midnight. It ends at 5 p.m. 5 p.m. 5 p.m. It's on the contract. So now after that, 5 p.m. I, did, I didn't mean to say the other word. Um, 5 p.m. It's on the contract and it's calendar days. So after that, you want to go ahead and and make sure your lender responds and they receive the contract and then ask them any questions that you might have. Um, and then you want to move forward, obviously. But remember, you've got the option period days to sort out if your buyer is going to move forward or not. If your buyer decides not to move forward for whatever reason, it's actually an option period. It's, um, it's whatever reason they can back out. Then they have that time to do so and they lose their option money, but they get their earnest money back as long as it's within the, the, the option period days. They do lose the option money. The option money is actually never refundable. It's just the contract dictates if the earnest money is refundable or not. So in that five days, let's pull up my contract. Actually, this is not a good contract because this didn't have a, an option period and it was a cash deal. So let's pull up a different one. So in this particular contract, they had a first American title is the title company. Look at that. Actually, Lou is my escrow officer. This is a, one I have under contract now. They gave a $400 um, option money for seven days. So they have seven days. Look at that, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Okay. Local time where the property is located. 5 p.m. I think I've said that enough. Now, inside that seven-day option period, you need to negotiate repairs or a price or concession in lieu of repairs. It has to all be negotiated. If not, you need to either A, terminate the contract with the earnest money. It's two, pay, two, two, two addendums that you use. Release of earnest money and contract notice of termination of contract. It's in your dot loop. Or B, you need to have an assigned, signed by all parties, amendment showing who's paying for the repairs or a concession in lieu of repairs. Three, or you need to have a signed executed by all parties, extension of the option period. Or lastly, your buyer just simply decides that he's okay with the property. He's not asking for any repairs or concessions and he's moving forward. And you don't have to have anything signed at that point, as long as your buyer gives you a text or an email saying that he's okay to move forward. At that point, you're gonna to wanna to have the lender order the appraisal because the lender is the one that orders the appraisal. Now the appraisal is the lender's verification of the property, separate from the buyer's inspection. The lender wants to make sure the property is suitable for the loan. The lender needs to know to go ahead and order that. Go ahead as soon as you know the buyer is moving forward. Go ahead and let the buyer, the lender know in an email and a text that the buyer's moving forward. Please order the appraisal ASAP. Why? Because the lender needs to order that appraisal because it takes a while for the appraisal to get done. It depends on the time of year. It depends on how busy they are. It can take a week. It can take three weeks. It can take longer. It just depends where the property is located, so on and so forth, how busy they are. Now, according to the contract, you also need to abide by the survey within blank days. In this particular case, I was the listing agent. I had seven days to give this current survey to the buyer, buyer's agent. And if not, if the survey isn't acceptable, the buyer pays for it. Well, guess what? I attached it to HAR. They already had it day zero. 
So I don't have to worry about that. I'm in compliance of the contract. But if you're the buyer's agent, you need to make sure that you, you make sure they stay in compliance with this. And if it's two and your buyer shall obtain a new survey, then you need to abide by how many days is written in there. So you need to go ahead and order the survey. You can order it through the title company. You can ask the title company to order the survey on your behalf, okay? With your buyer's permission, because your buyer at that point would be responsible for paying for it, even if the contract were to not close. Remember that. The lender is also gonna ask for the appraisal money up front as well. Now, the lenders ordered the appraisal, the buyer has got their inspection and they're, they're, they're a happy camper. Your survey is being ordered by the title company. Now, well, Ryan, what is next for me? Well, you need to wait for that appraisal to come in. In the meantime, you need to make sure your, your buyer is giving your uh, lender all their documentation that they asked for. Why is this important? Read your third-party financing addendum. If it's a conventional or whatever else loan, it's going to be one of those boxes are going to be checked. In this particular case, it's a conventional loan. This buyer, there's two types of, there's two parts of the approval. The loan has to go through an approval process or underwriting. And the buyer has to get full loan approval and the property has to get loan full loan approval. There's two approvals. The third party financing addresses this. Two, right here, approval of financing, buyer approval. This contract is subject to buyer being fully approved or obtaining buyer approval from the lender. That's after it gets out of underwriting and the lender says, okay, the buyer is fully approved. We're just waiting for the property to get fully approved, meaning the appraisal, the survey, things like that, because the lender does require a survey. Now, in this case, the, buy, the buyer has 15 days to get loan approval. So whatever day is in there, tip, hopefully for your buyers, it's 21 days, if that's what you were able to negotiate, then your buyer needs to get full loan approval within that time frame, And the date starts at the executed contract. So you need to get on the stick with that. Make sure the lender is getting on the stick with that because if you're past your, your days and your buyer doesn't have full loan approval and then somehow they get loan denied because of them, their credit score, et cetera, then they don't get their earnest money back according to the contract. If they do don't get full loan approval and you're still within your time period, then you need to verify that with the lender and then you need to send in a termination of contract with the release of earnest money, citing that the buyer cannot get loan approval within the days. That's why that date is so important. B, property approval. The property has to get approved. You're saying, well, Ryan, I can't control how fast the, the appraisal process takes. Correct, you can't, but there is stipulation in here that protects your buyer. The buyer, if buyer's lender determines that the property does not satisfy insurability and lender required repairs, not limited to appraisal, they have no later than three days before closing to terminate this contract. Um, if buyer terminates under this contract, earnest money will be refunded to buyer. So that means if a roof if the foundation, something isn't acceptable to the lender, then your buyer can back out because of the property condition approval required by the loan. That's gonna come from the appraisal. The appraiser will say if the roof doesn't qualify or the foundation doesn't qualify or so on and so forth. You're saying, I know you're asking a question right now, let's hold that. You're saying, can the buyer still move forward? Hold on. There's two parts to the property being approved. There's the property condition and there's the price. The price is a big one. I know you're going to ask that. Yes. In this paragraph, it adjusts the price for FHA and VA only. You want to put the sales price here to protect your buyer because it says if in so many words, if the financing described above involves FHA or VA, 
only, this is only if it's FHA or VA, it is agreed that buyers shall not be obligated to complete the purchase and get their earnest money back if it doesn't appraise for that amount that's in that line. There's no timeline on this as long as it's before closing. Now, you're saying, Ryan, this protects my buyer in an FHA or VA. Correct. What about conventional? I'm going to answer that because this, this doesn't address conventional and how much it should appraise for. I'm going to tell you that. It does, B does address property, uh, property, the condition of the property according to the lender, but it doesn't address the price other than FHA and VA. I know that. That's why you're going to include on your DA checklist, you're going to include an appraisal addendum. Addendum concerning right to terminate due to a lender's appraisal. In a conventional loan, it is required by our office that you have this in there. You're going to check most likely three and you're going to fill that out. X days, I would at least put 20 to 30 days in there if you can get away with it because it takes a little while for the appraisals to be done. And then you're going to put the sales price in there. And then that protects your buyer. If buyer terminates under this paragraph, the earnest money will be for funded to buyer. It says, in addition to paragraph 2B of the third party financing addition, addendum. So that also means the, buy, the property has to get approved by the lender, meaning the condition of it. Now, don't mistake that for a full-blown home inspection. The appraisal is not a full-blown home inspection. They're going to go through the property in about 15 minutes, and they're making sure that it, it meets this minimum requirements for the loan. They're not going to check everything like your buyer's home inspector is. They're going to check mainly the big ticket items, hot water heater, roof, make sure everything's functioning, make sure everything works. Make sure appliances are there and aren't, aren't empty holes there. Make sure there's flooring. Make sure it's a fully functional house. Make sure the roof on a conventional and FHA loan, the roof has to have two to three years of functioning life left in it. What does that mean? It, that's determined by the appraisal appraiser. I, they, they have to, they, in their minds, they have to note and be okay with that the roof has at least two to three more years of functioning life left in it. I'll let it be that, be said at that. I can't elaborate on that. That's up to the appraiser. The whoever goes out there, you cannot pick the appraiser either. Sorry, not anymore. Back 10, 12, 13, 14 years ago, you could, not anymore. Okay, so we've gone over that. We've gone over the appraisal pretty extensively. There's other things. You need to make sure you have in your DA checklist, like you need to have the buyer sign off on the seller's disclosure, the mud form, lead-based paint, of uh, course, information about brokered services. There's my survey. The T47 always has to accompany the survey if the survey was provided by the seller. There's the pre-approval letter. There's the mud. So I have all my ducks in a row. I'm going to make sure also I'm abiding by the HOA addendum. This one, because sometimes this is filled out and either your seller or the buyer needs to get certain information from the HOA. You can use the title company to get that information. So let's say it's not checked, the four is checked, so they don't require the subdivision information. Okay, you can still get the, sub, the deed restrictions from the, uh, the, for the neighborhood, ask the title company for them. They'll send them to you. I just did that and they sent them to me. No charge on this particular case. So ask the title company. The title company and the lender is going to be big go-tos. That's why I wanted you to send that email to them in the beginning to go ahead and start the relationship. Now, at closing, this is saying your buyer is going to pay up to X amount for the transfer of the property um, for the HOA. Now, just be cautious with this if you're the listing agent, because now HOAs are charging entrance and exit fees, and that's technically considered a transfer of the property. So here's an example. In, 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 in my, I'll, I'll give you the example. It was actually this particular case. 
in this particular case, I'll give you literally, I'm giving you the upfront case scenario. This is my buyer, was my buyer. We closed. In this particular neighborhood, there was an entrance and exit fee charged by the HOA due at closing. It was like a thousand bucks for the entrance fee and 2000 bucks for the exit fee. And then another, I think it was a $150 transfer fee. Now you're saying Ryan C protected your buyer. They only, um, the buyer, it says buyer shall pay not transfer fee, not to exceed $350. Okay. So you're saying, well, the buyer had to pay the $150 transfer fee. Yep. I agree. And I figured that was the case, but it says up to, you're saying, well, Ryan, they paid the 150 transfer fee at closing. They agreed to it. They said they would pay up to $350. I agree that I agree with that, but guess what? The capitalization fee which included an entrance and an exit fee of $1,000 each. Um, it was technically a transfer fee because it was due at the transfer of the sale. So it wasn't called a transfer fee. It was called an entrance and an exit fee. So the title company said, traditionally, the buyer pays the entrance fee, the seller pays the exit fee. And I said, okay, but I protected my buyer for up to $350. It says all other charges associated with the transfer of the property, which in my mind includes the entrance and the exit fee. So I told her, no, we're going to cap it according to the contract at $350. The rest, the seller will have to pay. And guess what happened? 